James was most recently the chief scientific officer at CypherSkin Inc., uh, which is actually a wearable health company. Um, and James has been uh, researching uh, research integrity problems for over a decade um, and has also developed popular statistical techniques for finding different inconsistencies in published work. So uh, really kind of a focus here on some of the meta science and what's going wrong in the world of science right now, um, and then potential ways of alleviating those things. Um, so if Twitter follower count means anything, James has got 20,000 followers um, and he's followed by um, the likes of people like Mark Andreessen and some uh, open science um, kind of pioneers such as uh, Brian Nosek of OSF. Um, James is a self-proclaimed loud MFer, and uh, I'm, re I'm really excited and curious to hear his presentation on who the, uh, the most dangerous scientist in the world is. So uh, what I can guarantee will be the most fun talk of uh, this entire uh, session. So James, good to have you here and uh, let us know who's the most dangerous scientist. How are you, Jeff? You good? Yeah, doing great. All right. Hello to everyone else in the room. I'd recognize a couple of names. Thank you for reeling off how many people are on my twirtles. Um, to be quite honest, I have I have no idea. I treat that like I treat many other things in life. I open it, yell into it, and then disappear again. To me, it's kind of like a cupboard where I can't find something. So <clears throat> can you see that okay? Yep, 1984. Super. So this is a this is a talk that I'm planning on giving more. When Jeff said you should definitely come and uh, and tell us about this, I thought, oh, what a super shit hot opportunity to actually start working through uh, some of these things from scratch. As I'm presently planning on doing a little bit more of this, and now here we are. Uh, to my lasting dissatisfaction, I like to write long titles for talks um, because they give me pleasure. So. The most dangerous scientist in the world, Reflections of a Vindictive Little Bastard on Scientific Integrity by me, Dr. James Heather's Vindictive Little Bastard. So we're going to have to unpack that uh, to, to a minor degree. Um, I should probably introduce myself to a minor degree. Yeah, I've done, I've been working in startups for the last five years, but before that I was a research scientist, before that I was a postdoc, before that I was a PhD student. I've always been very interested in the question of whether or not science is accurate. And because I am of a certain, uh, what I've come to accept is my piratical nature. Um, I'm most interested in times where it's actually gone wrong. And I was talking to people about this previous and so well, you, you, you go out into the world and then you, uh, you look for things that are wrong or people give you tips on where to look for things that are wrong, and then you try and figure out how they're wrong with various computational methods, uh, and then you sort of make trouble. Apparently that makes me a privateer and not a pirate. So same, same difference, I'll take it, probably comes with a nicer coat. But my PhD was in 2015, uh, conferred in 2015, and I've been, I've been doing this work sort of on and off from, before that and on an ongoing basis and really still even now. So the approach to it has changed over time. And I feel like after 10 years, give or take, it's about time I delivered something approximating a retrospective, which is you're gonna see is something of a work in progress. So let's talk about vindictive little bastard. This is from an article in the, uh, I think about 2018 in the uh, uh, Chronicle of uh, Higher Education. So, <clears throat> So you can see from these marvelous little quotes here. Um, yes, the first one, perfectly accurate. Uh, psychologists used to talk about their next clever study. Now they fret about whether their findings can withstand withering scrutiny. Um, also accurate, I think just uh, the place where I would disagree with other people is that I think that's an absolutely brilliant thing um, and other people, not so much. Um, you have no idea how many people are debating leaving the field because of these thugs. Uh, that's me. Uh, well, me and people like me. I'm going to say we from here on. A tenure psychologist, the one who called them human scum, told me. It's nice to be called human scum by someone with tenure. Um, it uh, really, really gives you a warm feeling like you're doing something right. And then, of course, 
uh, didn't want me to use his name because he's afraid the data thugs will go after him. They're vindictive little bastards, he said. So that's my second favorite insult that's ever been published about me. Little's wrong. I'm like 280, 285. So I don't like the little part, which is vindictive. Big bastard doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, and us, the we that I talked about before, people who are interested in what we call forensic metascience, where you proactively investigate what goes wrong with science more broadly, have been called all sorts of names. Um, and there have been all sorts of opinions expressed about uh, the people who do this work. And this is my second favorite, vindictive little bastard. So, a quick digression. If you're a whistleblower, there are some things that you need to be very, very well aware of. And this is why they always recommend that you talk to a lawyer uh, as soon as humanly possible who has experience in this uh, area of law, because there's a, a, a kind of a confluence of interests between, say, a laboratory or a company or an organization that you work for and their rights and the rights of the public and the legal system to be able to prosecute a whistleblowing case, right? So I've dealt with a lot of scientific whistleblowers and I think there's three main pieces of advice that are the kind of the cut through that you should tell people who are in that situation. Number one, know your rights as just explained. Number two is what I call shut up and hurry, which is don't talk to anyone, don't give any outward uh, appearance that something is amiss. But at the same time, you don't know how you don't know how long your job is going to last. A lot of the time, you don't know how the environment that you're in is going to degrade over time professionally. Um, they may just start firing people left and right. Uh, they may figure out something is the problem uh, and terminate you. Uh, you may get put on a project that you don't want, etc. So you need to gather the information that you're going to gather in order to do uh, the service of. Uh, making sure that uh, the public is is being well served, presumably by people who are either taking their money or defrauding them. And number three, document, document, document. And this one hits home for me because ignoring this is how I lost the best insult ever that I ever got. And now I have to go from memory. And this is really disappointing. And I hesitate to talk about it because I don't have documentary evidence for this. You're just going to have to trust me. So we're doing this work a few years ago. Uh, this is Nick Brown and myself, mostly him, but, uh, you know, I helped. Uh, we were looking at the work of a social scientist from France who it seemed was incredibly prolific, wrote a whole bunch of sole author papers, and they're the, exactly the kind of, of papers that would probably make a DSI person reasonably suspicious. Uh, small, neat results about things that were kind of headline catching, but don't really matter. Um, never published with data, never published with sort of a broader, uh, bro a broader access to anything that's behind the, uh, the curtain, the veil of research. Um, so this is actually where some of the data techniques that Nick and I came up with and published, and there's papers on this, you can look them up some other time. Um, this is actually where they came from doing this work. So this is all these things that you see all these different, um, the different newspapers and websites and the rest of it, um, about 2017 to 2018. So we're doing this work. And I gave some particularly inflammatory interview, which I don't remember where it was, um, which basi basically said, well, we don't know how common this behavior is and we need to change scientific culture because having closed elements of it is terrible. And once everything is rigidly opened up, then um, maybe we'll just start to see how many people are fraudulent and should be thrown down a flight of stairs. Um, you know, something glib and Australian that doesn't really fit. So all of this is happening. It's getting plenty of press and someone writes to me and I wish I could remember who this was. All I remember is that they was a dude and they were Dutch. They had a, a dot NL address. Um, and they wrote because, I mean, the Dutch people, are, I, I love Dutch people. They're incredibly forthright. They'll look you right in the eye and tell you everything that you've done is terrible. Um, it makes it very easy to get through the day when you know where people stand. Um, so what you're doing is destructive and dangerous, and um, you're, you're literally undermining the scientific enterprise. You should stop. Now, when people write bollocks to me on the internet, I have very mature responses. So I said, I think I probably did, in fact, send this exact Pingu meme on the basis that I am not particularly interested in your opinion. And they came back 
at me with the epic. If you continue doing this work, I think you were the most dangerous scientist in the world, which is so unnecessarily butch. Um, because it's very much not the case. It's a very David Brent thing to say. But imagine what, what does the background of the scientific enterprise have to be when you are volunteering your time to find elements of it that are legitimately wrong, that are either they're wildly inaccurate to the point where they shouldn't exist or they're actively fraudulent. And often you can't tell the difference between the two. It's one or the other, but it doesn't change the eventual accuracy of it. You're doing that work and someone thinks that's such a terrible idea that out of all the scientists in the world, including the ones who presumably work on weapons programs, that I'm the dangerous one. And that's obviously very much not the case. But that's the environment that we've built for ourselves in this enterprise where someone can say that to me in good conscience and not feel ridiculous. I'm not sure how that's possible. And I'm going to spend the next 20 ish minutes trying to convince you that there are some very, very big problems in the scientific enterprise. And I will also be including why I think the people who are on this particular conference call are part of the solution. So let's get away from the memes. I've said we before. Who is we? We is anyone in this case who works in forensic meta science. And we have to call it something. So both of these words are probably words that people will be familiar with. Forensic, obviously. Meta science, um, just for the record, the systematic study of the scientific enterprise using scientific methods. And you can see what forensic would imply in that particular point in time, because what you're doing is going into elements of published papers or the, the metadata that surrounds the individual publications taken on mass, so kind of scientometric methods, uh, the numerical elements of any given paper, and of course the words themselves, and looking in them for problems within the publication. So I split these into four categories that cross over to a certain degree. Um, obviously, really, really quick, Jack, trying to share screen on anything by any chance? Yes. Okay, because there hasn't been a share screen. Um, well, you... that's very that's very bad. Yeah, we enjoyed the monologue, but um, we'll get. <laughs> oh dear me! And I can't see when the thing is on. Okay, is that behaving itself better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh dear me! Okay, I wish you'd said previously. Well, to talk about this is. Uh, there's probably a replication joke in here, but now I'm burning my time. So let's do this real fast. Watch this. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. Vindictive. Me, vindictive little bastard. Uh, advice to whistleblowers. Show your rights. Shut up and hurry. Document. I didn't document. I lost a copy of my best insult ever. Uh, I was doing some better scientific work. It was going very well. Someone wrote to me to tell me it was a terrible idea. I was a child about it because I thought they were being ridiculous. They called me the most dangerous scientist in the world. I think that is unnecessarily butch and hairy chested and ridiculous. Um, and now we're on a slide about how all the different areas of forensic metascience work together to detect problems in scientific culture and papers more broadly. Recap over. Let me tell you why it matters. Presumably, you can see this now. Yes. Super. Okay, let's talk about the plague. So this is the hydroxychloroquine story. Um, everyone's probably familiar with this to at least a moderate degree because it was very loud for a while, wasn't it? Um, there was a, an initial preprint right at the start of the plague that said it's good fun to uh, it's good fun to treat uh, people who are sick in hospital and recovering from COVID nineteen. This is the original strain, the OG, uh, the original Coke COVID. Um, this this works. Uh, it's endorsed in South America. They fire the Brazilian health minister because he does, doesn't want to give it out to people. Um, various political leaders uh, endorse it. Um, 
they test it. Uh, this is during which the, the FDA has a, issued an emergency use order, so you can actually get it. Um, eventually, that stops because they're running a big trial called Solidarity that shows it doesn't work at all. Um, the, 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 the partial results of that showed that it was terrible. The eventual results of that uh, showed that it was um, it, it just it just wasn't working at all. Um, and after the first year, the WHO in about a year, the WHO issues a strong recommendation against actually using it. And at that particular point in time, there's a particular online pharmacy called RavQ, uh, who were rolled up with one of the uh, charming groups of doctors who were advocating for the use of this particular drug without what we would consider to be good evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Continuing all the way to the present day, to some degree, here's the question. When did we know this research couldn't be trusted? And the answer is there. And I'm really annoyed with that arrow because I can't get it two days from the publication of that with the pixels on the screen. I'm going to need a bigger screen to get the damn thing closer. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when that original paper was published, all of the people who are in the sort of community that are interested in scientific accuracy all showed up to look through how the pieces of that study worked. And they left a wonderful thread on Pub here that is now really interesting historical reading where there were some really glaring and obvious data and process problems within that particular study. It should have been the start of nothing. It should have, it should never have been the, the, the paper that launched a thousand scripts. I just thought of that. Oh, that's, that's fun. I'm keeping that. That should never have happened. It was, it was very bad. I'm not going to read all of these things out. Uh, I promise you, you can go and have a good time looking on the pub peer record of this one for yourself. Everything was going very, very badly for that particular team of researchers. And yet all of this happened anyway. And we knew there. As in, we were quite certain that there was absolutely no reason to assume that a paper that was just poorly performed and potentially dishonest because it was described in two different, uh, two different ways in two different sources at an absolute minimum. Uh, something that's this important probably should have the same sample size regardless of where it's being presented uh, and the data handling should be completely explicit. Neither of those things were true in a way where you would be very upset with an undergraduate who presented you with a preliminary and then an eventual piece of research where they, the pieces didn't match up properly. So that was tremendously problematic and we knew Again, I'm going back to the sort of collective we of the people, the people who are interested in forensic medicine science as an area. We knew two days afterwards. And then we had everything that we had after that. But let's not stop there and sort of talk about the issue of important. Let's continue to go through another drug in our particular, of the fun that we had during COVID with these things. This is a... Uh, this is a meta-analysis of uh, randomized trials for the treatment of ivermectin. Um, significant effect on viral clearance, borderline significant effect on duration of hospitalization. Probably two very good things on the way through. Um, only minor problem uh, is that a wide variety of these, of these trials, I think we, we stopped really counting when we got to, I think, five. Uh, of the trials that were internal to that particular meta-analysis were not well conducted. And some of them were sufficiently fraudulent to the extent where one of them had patients who died before the trial started. Um, this was sort of an environment of accuracy uh, that was well reproduced in some of these other papers, to say the least. So the people who did this meta-analysis redid it and published this wonderful figure. Well, if we look at the uh, improvement of survival on the y-axis here, and then we remove the potentially fraudulent studies, and then we remove the high-risk studies, and then we remove the occasionally concerning studies, we go from a significant p-value to a really wildly non-significant p-value. Um, and you might have noticed the titles changed a little bit here as well. Uh, it's gone from this is meta-analysis to this is meta-analysis where we addre address potential bias and medical fraud. Not great. Really not great. Um, 
And both of these eventually turned out to be expressions of a third thing, which I call the cuckoo bird problem. Now, cuckoos are really interesting, and they're not the only breed that do this, but they're certainly the most famous one. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, and then other birds raise those chicks with the rest of their brood. And you can see that's a cowbird that's done it there on the left, minor difference in the egg. And then eventually, as you can see on the right-hand side, minor, minor difference in the size between the mother on the right-hand side and the baby cuckoo that's on the left. So there's a, there's a metaphor here. There is a, a big, unusual, and highly unlike its peers contribution to uh, a kind of basket. And in this case, I'm talking about a basket of scientific studies. So let's take that metaphor and use it. This is a paper from 2014 uh, from Daryl France, uh, Daryl Francis Research Group, Buri et al. This is an absolutely marvelous paper. It's about whether or not people who have a heart condition should take perioperative beta blockers. Now, they decrease work that happens to the heart, which is good if you've got a cardiac problem, but at the same time, they increase the risk of stroke. So which is more dangerous on aggregate determines what our eventual uh, decision about the recommendation of the drug should be. Now, if you look carefully on the top there, where I've got the little fly catcher on the left-hand side, and look at the bottom of the risk ratio, you can see that the conclusion without the problematic studies that we were about to see um, is that in general these these beta blockers that seem to be uh, seem to be dangerous and they seem to be contributing to something problematic here. But if we include these two decreased trials, and these are very famous in meta scientific circles for having all sorts of problems, and uh, came out of a, a lab in the Netherlands about a, a decade and a bit ago, and there were several of them over time, and you can see that. Uh, the risk ratio is completely the wrong way around. So what it essentially amounts to is, if we're taking a meta-analysis and we parcel up a whole series of studies that have one conclusion, and then we include a fake or a problematic or a wildly inaccurate one that has a different conclusion, and we mash them all together, they end up changing the eventual outcome. And that's a cuckoo bird problem. And this happened most likely for hydroxychloroquine in some sense, and it very definitely happened in ivermectin. And it, this is also, I mean, I have, I have other examples of this as well, but this is, I'm working on limited time here. Now, when it comes to danger, I think we can retire the whole idea of the dangerous scientist thing. This is very silly. If we're going to talk about danger, I think this is the most dangerous research integrity problem that's going around. Not the most common because we have regular garden variety, pea hacking and harking and data forgetting and all sorts of other things that are common and problematic yet not particularly dangerous. It's certainly not the one that's worse for the sort of collective public perception of science, but this very definitely is the one that's most likely to kill people. So for the most dangerous scientist in the world, I think this is the most dangerous problem in the world. The idea that there is simply not enough scrutiny on individual studies to be able to avoid adding them on aggregate to big bags of other studies where they will ruin their conclusions. And the problem with this, the reason that it's the most dangerous, and why that's the, the, the operative word here, is very simple and it's because a lot of the time these eventual conclusions are things like society guidelines for should we do a therapy, should we do a drug, uh, should, should we behave in this particular way during the recovery of some person who's actually ill. Obviously I'm talking about medical research at this point in time, it's very hard to kill people with bad archeology span research, someone's probably tried, it didn't work out, this is where the party is. So, that being the case, this whole pantheon of problems, and obviously I've, I've, I've skipped around a lot in the last half hour to try and get to this point. How all the pieces of this fit together individually? 
are all directly affected by problems that decentralized science involves. Which is something that I'm very interested in until incredibly recently, simply have not had the time and uh, opportunity and bandwidth to become more familiar with. I'm very much looking forward to doing that. Um, but what specifically are the problems that I'm talking about? Siloed data and lack of patient level data. Um, the unbearable slowness of the publication system, especially I, mean, I could tell you some marvelous stories about those ivermectin papers or when a paper was published and you write to the editors within 72 hours and it takes them three months to correct the paper. But at that point in time, you've seen the uh, South American government has made the decision to start handing the drug out like M&Ms uh, because there was extra clinical evidence that it worked. Well, there wouldn't be if people could uh, update their journals more quickly because we're not talking about a nice federated universe of interconnected nodes where uh, researchers are empowered to make changes for themselves. We're talking about something that's gated by someone who doesn't want to talk to someone like me. Obviously, your way is better, gang. Like, no one's going to argue about that. And I wish you every success in building it because citizen science is presently not empowered with this ecosystem to participate in the big narratives. If it was, we would never have had the problems that we did with hydroxychloroquine to start with. That was simply, a, it, was, it was a bad idea. The research on it was terrible and there was not a megaphone or a system big enough to make that point as the issue became more broadly discussed. I'm not sufficiently cynical that I think that, uh, well, no one can be reached. People are gonna make up their mind and conspiratorial ideation will do the rest. No, or at least not to the same degree. We have figures of authority that we all accept for a reason. I think the easiest way for them to have authority is, is for it to be legitimately derived from a system where everyone is an equal participant. So if you're all out there in a very different way to me, but in, in many respects similar in the fact that you are trying to empower the individual pieces within the kind of network of the scientific commons to be able to point out things that are wrong, expurgate the information that is available and make sure that the funding and the attention is democratized, then um, I'm very happy to meet everyone. Now, I think we've got a couple of minutes left and I'm out of shit. <clears throat> so how about it? Uh, that was awesome, James. Um, and like a, a very like, I think enjoyable way of uh, pressing and pushing on uh, a tender spot in science. Um, one question I had was, um, and you, you brought this up at the end and I really liked the way you framed it, which is um, the megaphone. So right now the megaphone is placed on a lot of like the prestige in some of the high-end journals. Um, and it seems like the people who often have some pretty knowledgeable insight um, often get muffled um, in, I don't know, the communication route to be able to portray what they're thinking about. So how do we, what's, so, okay, we know the, the big problem here. Um, so how do we readjust where that megaphone is to be able to give attention to people who are saying the right things? And then what cost does that come with in, because nothing's perfect. So your megaphone might, mm. some people who might not need a megaphone nope. at it's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good question. There's a short-term and a long-term answer to that. The short-term answer is we don't have anyone who does the sort of work that me and mine do, who is really empowered, who has a public position where they're allowed to talk about these things. There are things that are close. The Science, Me the Science Media Centre in the UK comes immediately to mind. But again, we're talking about people who are sort of claiming the mantle of authority. Eventually, Eventually, what we have is something that it looks a lot like a re replication market where there's an aggregate measure of something. Yeah. And not just a matter of, I mean, even, even the idea that 10,000 people who were fully informed could actually be voting on something and would themselves be uh, extremely well informed. You think about what would happen if you, for any given pub peer thread, if there was a replication market on the outcome of what eventually was going to happen happen to that in the first place. The vast majority of the time, the, the, the dial would either be at 100% or zero, because a lot of problems with an individual piece of science are binary. Yeah? If I, if I add it all up wrong, 
And the methodology that I've used is flawed past a certain point. I haven't actually established anything. I haven't gone from zero to one. Uh, and it's not a question of going from zero to a half. We've just gone nowhere. You just basically put words and numbers in order to the achievement of nothing at all. So the, the eventual ability to put that in public is powered somehow by a, a commonality of people who are able to understand it. Right? Who would you rather have? Let's say, let's say there's a new novel virus, and we have the ability to ask 10,000 virologists who are all intimately involved with the understanding of, of uh, uh, its, its uh, structure, uh, the problems that it causes, function, uh, transmissibility, et cetera. They have literally all of that information, and it's appropriately structured, and it's in front of them. And then they're asked to make uh, a decision by some mechanism. The, the problem with getting there, and the reason that I say this is like a, a singular authority in the short term, is that what we do, the whole idea of let's take a piece of science and then kick its tires, is not something that's ever really done in peer review. It is a, a little, a little bit by specific individuals, but it's not what people are trained to do. It's certainly not part of the culture of what peer review is supposed to mean. Peer review is not for that. A lot of people think it is. That's a very naive thing to think. And I can understand why people do, because it sounds like it should be. But look, mate, I have published plenty of papers with accompanying data, because I think that's what you're supposed to do. And in two of those occasions, I have had a code and data repository where I realized I haven't made the code and data repository public. I just forgot to click the button. I'm the sort of person who forgets to click buttons. And what that means is both of those papers sailed right the way through peer review, and no one even thought to open the code that would run on the data that I sent to be able to do the peer review in the first place. And that, as a kind of a cultural item, is the thing that really, the mentality and the tools and the environment that leads you there is the center of what really has to change. Yeah, very well said. Um, we're going to do, we'll do a quick one for the next minute or two, uh, and then we've got to move on to the next panel, but this one's from the audience. Um, so is DSI, and maybe um, since you're just getting into it, this might be a, kind of a little bit of hand-waving here for you, but is DSI doing a good job at explaining its goals and scope to a general scientific research audience? It seems like these problems are obvious and potential solutions are identified, but maybe that's not commonly understood outside of the field. Okay, I think if I said yes to that, you'd probably take it too seriously. And what I mean by that is, all of these things are long games. Every single thing within, within the entire milieu, problems that I think about, the problems that you think about, the problems you're probably involved in at work, they're all long games and we're all impatient. I get that, I'm wildly impatient. I have to fight it as an active cognitive process. My frontal lobes get a lot of work teaching me how to not be impatient about things. So, so far, has it resonated well? Not really. Is that a problem in the short term? Also, not really. Yeah, there's that it does it does seem obvious to me, but I'm the silly gonad who spent the last ten years staying up until two in the morning because I just want to see what the uh, what the covariate structure of some paper that was published looked like because I'm just a curious and difficult person. So it makes sense to me. And has it traveled more broadly? Well, it's very hard for things to travel more broadly. Let's have the kind of patience that's implied by doing what doing the like the change in the landscape here is going to eventually uh, is going to eventually provide. I think what more than anything else, like if I think of things like this when it comes to sort of cultural terms, a little bit like startups. In the fact that people want to start and then, you know, they think, well, you know, it's May. I think by about October, I'll be Jeff Bezos. No, you won't. You won't. That's not going to happen. You won't. You're going to the first 18 months is going to make you want to throw yourself off the white cliffs of Dover into the sea. You want to, want to, <laughs> it's it's going to be really, really, really difficult. What you I, I honestly think that one of the single best things that you can do if you're if that's something that concerns you 
is you want to pick these, there is going to be a confluence of circumstances and problems where a solution that you offer works way better than anything else, where there aren't any structural barriers for people who, who, who want to participate in it, where there's actually a need. And especially in an environment like this, where people have the ability, where they are empowered to get away from the traditional academic cultural answer to something, right? So don't worry about, does everyone get it? Eventually, like that's going to be how it is. Find the tribe of people for whom you really solve a problem who are going to be your psychotic adopters, the people who are really going to care and make them happy. And then do that again, and then do that again, and then start to think about network effects. Yeah. Or, you know, hire a, hire a team of ghostwriters and uh, just start filling the internet. Or maybe maybe, maybe you could use ChatGPT these days, you know, a large language model about all the problems with scientific culture. Um, and, you know, have some, have some fun. Fill the internet with more rancid garbage. It'll be a laugh. That's yeah. sarcastic. I didn't mean any of that. Okay, no one do that. All right, we're done. We'll all get our burner phones as recommended by James. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you so much, James. That was uh, a real special treat. Uh, appreciate it so much. We're uh, going to have to, just to stay on track, bounce over to the next panelist, which stop, starts in the next minute. So, uh, Super. Very nice to meet you all. I'm extremely easy to find. If you want to talk about anything like this, I promise you, I'm a, I'm a Google search away. We don't have business cards anymore because it isn't 1985. Find me if you need me. I'll see you all later. Mm -hmm.